In today's lecture, we are going to talk about reverse osmosis membranes and flow patterns in RO systems. And if we have enough time, we'll talk about RO skid design. Let's just uh, take a look at the RO membranes. RO membranes are designed to separate ions and solute from water. And in this kind of separation, there are several mechanisms proposed by previous uh, researchers and scientists. Uh, one of the one of the well-known uh, mechanism and also widely used mechanism is the solution diffusion model. So in this part, we are going to study the solution diffusion model. Solution diffusion model or we can say this as the non porous model because in this model uh, people assume that the, the RO membrane is non porous that's the assumption in the in the solution diffusion model the transport of solvent and solute are independent of each other. So uh, that means we needed to have two equations. Equation one for water transport, equation two for the solute transport. And the separation is done because the transport rate for water and solutes are different. The flux of solvent through the membrane is linearly proportional to the driving force. In this case, the driving force is the effective uh, pressure difference. That's the driving force. So uh, we can express it uh, as an equation and that's the equation that we are talking about here so JW is the flux of solvent A is the water permeability coefficient that's correlate between the driving force and the final outcome and here of course the driving force the, is the pressure difference and in this case the pressure difference means the difference between the applied pressure and the osmotic pressure because in our system uh, as long as the the applied pressure is higher than this osmotic pressure separation can happen so um, that was the equation for the water transport on the other hand, we also needed to have another equation. This is the, which is the um, equation for uh, solute transport. So in this equation, the flux of solute through the membrane is proportional to the effective solute concentration difference. So in this case, the driving force is the effective solute concentration difference, which is this one. So that's the driving force. And this is the uh, flux of solute. And again, in this case, K is the salt permeability coefficient. And this is a function of salt diffusivity through the membranes. So we have membranes and water can pass through the membrane and solute also can also pass through the membrane but the rate of water transport is far much higher than this the rate of solute transport so that we can uh, reject we can separate solute uh, 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 solute from water these are the examples showing the relationship between the water flux and applied pressure. 
and salt rejection uh, versus uh, applied pressure. So in this case, um, if you increase the applied pressure, what's happening is the water flux increases as you increase as you increase the applied pressure. However, solid flux remains constant because uh, the applied pressure does not affect the solute flux. Um, that is the that is that is the one that you can imagine from the previous from the pro previous equation. Of course, if the pressure is lower than this osmosis pressure, there will be no water transport, and as long as this applied pressure is higher than this osmotic pressure we can create the water flux. So by combining these two, this water flux, sorry, let's, um, water flux and salt flux, and the rejection is actually the, is uh, determined by the ratio of water flux and salt flux. Because if you have a, a lot of water flux and very small solute flux, that means we, we have very high rejection for this solute. So that means um, the salt rejection, the salt rejection is proportional to the applied pressure, just like this. So if the pressure is uh, lower than a certain value, the rejection is lower. Rejection is very low. That's the that's this region. However, if you have um, the uh, if you have the uh, applied pressure over a certain value, you can see very high rejection values, as you can see here. So um, anyway, uh, what you can uh, what you have to remember is first water flux proportional to the the applied pressure solute flux or salt flux is um, not affected by the um, applied pressure so the rejection is somehow affected by applied pressure. This slide also sh uh, shows the relationship between flux and rejection. And as I already explained, flux is linearly proportional to the, the applied pressure, but the rejection increase with an increase in the applied pressure, but this relationship is not linear. So um, in the beginning, it rapidly increases, increases, but after a certain uh, applied pressure, the it slowly, it starts to slowly increases. So um, again, that's something that you always have to remember because um, when you apply reverse osmosis technology, flux as well as rejection is important. So um, you have to know the conditions that affect the uh, flux and rejection. Solution diffusion model assumes that the membrane is non for us. But is it really true? Uh, sometimes some membranes, um, it is really difficult to explain the phenomena just uh, by using the solution diffusion model. So people try to develop new types of the transport model. And one of them is, of course, this one, the solute 
diffusion imperfection model, which assumes that this membrane is also porous. The solution diffusion models, uh, the performance of the perfect membranes, uh, the solution uh, diffusion theory models the performance of the perfect membrane. Perfect in this case means the uh, the non-porous membrane. In reality, industrial membranes are plagued with imperfections because uh, it's not really perfect to have the uh, ideal membranes. So in reality, in reality, uh, sometimes we have some. Um, imperfect, uh, some um, uh, weak part that actually affect the transport. The basis of the diffusion imperfection model is the assumption that slight imperfection in the membrane occur during manufacturing that allows for the leakage of solution through the membrane. So if I draw something, uh, we may have a very small pore in, inside this membrane. So uh, normally, water can pass through the membrane by diffusion. But through this imperfection part, the water can also pass through um, uh, by the mechanism of convection. and diffusion. This model helps uh, explain why lower than projected separation of solute and water were observed for industrial membranes than was uh, predicted by the solution diffusion model. Let's take a look at the model equation in this case. So as I already explained, there are two mechanisms here. So diffusion as well as convection should be considered. So the diffusion part is reflected by, the, by this term in this equation. And convection part is uh, reflected by the second term in this equation. One thing that you have to remember is if you have uh, an imperfect part and if water can pass through this uh, part, the water uh, also contains salt, so there will be no rejection in this case. So that will result in a lower um, rejection. Um, than this ideal rejection that you can uh, expect from an ideal membrane. So anyway, um, that's the total water transport. And there are two parts. Um, and by considering two mechanisms, we can uh, obtain this kind of equation. And that's for water. And what about the salt or solute? In this case, again, we also have to consider the diffusion and, and convection. So if you consider that, you, again, we can have two terms here. And by adding these two terms, we can calculate the water flux as well as uh, the salt rejection or salt flux. Experiments have shown that the solution diffusion imperfection model fits data better than the solution diffusion model alone and better than all other forest models. However, the solution diffusion model is most often cited due to its simplicity and the uh, fact that it accurately models the performance of the perfect auto membrane. So previously, um, long time ago, when people uh, did not have very good technology to fabricate the auto membranes, 
the imperfect the possibility to have imperfection parts in the outer membrane uh, was very high. So uh, we had to apply the solution diffusion imperfection model to fit the experimental data. But recently, especially in case of the uh, seawater uh, reverse osmosis membranes, very tight membranes, in this case, um, the possibility to have imperfection part is low, so solution diffusion model can be successfully applied. In addition, um, in fact, the solution diffusion model is very simple and very intuitive, and it, it actually requires only two parameters, so there are a lot of the application possibilities. So that's why uh, the solution diffusion model is still a very popular model for fitting the results from the RO experiments. So you, uh, at least you have to know how to apply solution diffusion model uh, when you carry out the RO experiments. Unlike a solution diffusion model and solution diffusion imperfection model, there is another approach to model the, the RO membrane performances. And one of them is the preferential sorption capillary flow model. So again, this model assumes that this RO membrane is porous. So this is a kind of porous model. In this model, solvent flux is given by this equation where transport is proportional to the pressure driving force. The solid, total, total uh, solid flux depends on diffusion and is given by this equation. Uh, so, uh, um, so, sorry, um, this equation was already introduced in our previous slide. So the water flux equation is same for solution, diffusion, and preferential sorption capillary flow model. So they use same um, model equation for water transport. However, when uh, we consider the uh, salt flux or solute flux, in, in, this in this case, we needed to up uh, introduce another type of this model equation, which is shown here. So in this case, um, we have the driving force, that's the concentration difference, and we have this salt flux, solute flux, and the uh, coefficient has three terms. The first term is the diffusivity of solute in membrane and and another term is the effective uh, thickness of the membrane. So oh, we have two terms uh, additionally introduced in this equation. So th it means that the solute rejection is affected not only by the diffusivity of solute in the membrane, but also by the th uh, effective thickness of the membrane. Another model that assumes the uh, porous structure of the outer membrane is the uh, finely porous model. This model is based on a balance of applied and frictional forces in a one-dimensional four so in, in one dimensional four, uh, there should be a balance between the applied pressure, applied force, force, and frictional force. The model uh, considers frictions between the solute and solvent and between the solute and the membrane materials. So there are several types of the friction uh, considered in this model. The model also includes the membrane thickness and fractional four area of the membrane surface. 
Due to the complexity of the model, it is not represented uh, mathematically here. But if you are interested, you can find you know, try to look up some of the references. Uh, so um, this is a, a mathematically very complex model, which can be explained by uh, several slides. But um, um, it uh, it is more strongly related to the mechanisms and the structures of the membrane. So sometimes you may need to apply this model instead of this uh, solu to diffu uh, so solution diffusion model. So in such cases, please try to find the references that describes this model. Uh, another type of the uh, approach is based on irreversible thermodynamics. Or uh, in, in this case, we say that as the phenomenological transfer relationship. Uh, phenomenological transfer relationship can be developed even in the absence of any knowledge of the membrane of transfer, uh, uh, knowledge of the mechanisms of the transfer through the membrane or any information about the membrane structure. So, phenomenological means we only uh, look at the final result or phenomena happening around the membrane. And so, we don't need to know uh, the inside the membrane. So, we will just model the system by using the result um, around the membranes. So uh, that's the basic assumption and basic approach um, used by this uh, type of the models. The basis of irreversible thermodynamics assumes that if the system is divided into small enough subsystems in which local equilibrium exists, uh, thermodynamic equations can be written for the subsystems. So again, this model um, is quite complex. So, uh, and it's beyond the scope of this um, textbook. So I'm not going to explain details about this model. So, but I just want to point out that this model is kind of black box model. Uh, black box model means if you uh, model a system, sometimes you need to look inside the system. So, um, uh, four models, porous models and solution diffusion model, they are related to the uh, membrane structures and other uh, properties of the membranes. But in this case, this is uh, the one of the black box models, which means we don't care about the structure of the membranes and properties of the membrane, we will only um, look at the phenomena happening in, in the system. So sometimes we need to look at the, we need to use the model, uh, um, uh, mechanistic model, and sometimes we also need to use this kind of this uh, black box models. So depending on the purposes, you have to select proper models. So uh, we studied the uh, uh, transport models that describes the result of the 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 auto membrane performances. So um, let's now talk about the membrane structures or membrane materials. Uh, so uh, when we consider the membrane materials, there are two typical materials that um, uh, which are um, used uh, to fabricate the outer membranes. One of them is cellulose acetate, and the other one is polyamide. So um, let's take a look at them one by one. So um, cellulose acetate membranes were the first commercially available membranes developed by Srirajan and Loeb and a long time ago. 
Um, but this, uh, in the history of the reverse osmosis technology, these membranes are very important. These membranes were commercially viable because of its relatively high flux due to the extreme thick, you know, thinness of the membrane. So these membranes are very thin and these membranes are ha these membranes have the asymmetric structures. So uh, if you look at the cross section of the membrane, it only has a very um, thin tight layer on the surface of the membrane and then we have a very porous structures um, formed um, just um, on um, the other part of this membrane. So that's porous support and this the, um, the tight the um, active layer. High flux is uh, important to reduce the size and cost of the outer membrane. So this, um, um, in 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 this in this context, this membrane was very successful. By the way, this is the chemical structure of the cellulose acetate outer membranes. So we can have this kind of polymers that consists that it consists of these um, unit uh, chemical structures. These are the same images of the cellulose acetate uh, membranes. So um, here we can see the cellulose acetate membrane layer and um, we also have the fabric backing to have the additional mechanical uh, the strengths. And the surface of these membranes um, is very smooth. So you can see smooth surface morphology observed by scanning electron microscopy as shown on this slide. The characteristics of cellulose acetate auto membrane are listed in this table. So the membrane type is homogeneous asymmetric. Salt rejection is around 95%, which is high but not high enough to be directly used for seawater desalination. Silicon rejection is also around 85%. And one of the disadvantages of this membrane is that this has very narrow pH range for its proper operation. So cellulose acetate is kind of natural polymer. So if it is exposed to a very high pH solution, it will be hydrolyzed. So the structure will be damaged, so we cannot use. So we have to maintain very narrow uh, uh, for pH ranges, which is too narrow to be widely used in many the applications for reverse osmosis. Uh, feed pressure, um, it, um, it ranges from 200 to 400 psi and it has the temperature tolerance up to uh, 30 Celsius degree, surface charge is natural and this membrane is very hydrophilic and it has very high uh, chlorine tolerance up to 1 mg per liter. So um, this is the disadvantage and this is advantage. So one of the um, clear advantages of this membrane is its very high chlorine tolerance. So if you have the microorganisms growing on the membranes, you can use chlorine to kill them so that we can easily clean the biofouling of these membranes. And fouling tolerance is very good because this is membrane is hydrophilic and surface is very smooth. As I already mentioned that cellulose acetate membrane cannot be used at high pH conditions. So for example, if the pH is higher than 8, 
In this case, the membrane lifetime decreases, start to start to to decrease, and um, it is very um, the membrane lifetime becomes very short if the pH is around eleven or twelve. So, on, under these conditions, we cannot use these membranes. The other type of the auto membrane is the poly um, polyamide and composite membranes. So previously, in case of the cellulose acetate membrane, this is a homogeneous membrane. So there is only one chemical, uh, one composing material in in that membrane. However, in 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 this case, this is the composite membranes, which means we have to use at least more than two different materials to uh, fabricate these uh, membranes. So um, instead of using cellulose acetate, at the, um, in this case, uh, people use the, the polyamide. And there are several different types of the polyamide. Uh, for example, uh, we can use linear aromatic polyamide um, uh, to uh, synthesize the auto membranes. And an example of such polymer is shown on this slide with this picture. Just as cellulose acetate membranes were created out of a single polymer, uh, it can be, uh, and this polymer was previously used by the membrane uh, called the uh, permacept. And in that case, um, people, uh, that, that was initially developed by this company named Dufong, and that was actually a, a, a first polyamide membrane used um, for reverse osmosis. And in this case, um, it it's similar to cellulose acetic membrane uh, because it used a single polymer. But nowadays, uh, we use different techniques to prepare the uh, polyamide membrane. So composite polyamide membranes are widely used um, in these days. And these membranes, sometimes called the thin film composite or TFC membranes, are essentially a composite of two polymers. So previously, the membranes like Permacep used, um, uses just, uh, use just a, a single polymer. But in this case, um, people combine more than two polymers to uh, create these membranes. So um, again, this is an example of a chemical structure of this well-known Dow membrane called the FT30. And this has this kind of the structure. And in this case, we have we, uh, people uses at least two different polymers. The technique uh, used here is called the interpatial polymerization. So in order to do that, we have to start with a uh, polysulfan support film, which is a porous film. So uh, there are pores um, inside this film. And, and then we first uh, fill this porous layer with uh, PEI. So PEI coating was, uh, should be done first. Then we just let this um, uh, contact with another polymer. So uh, TDI is uh, um, um, supplied to these uh, membranes to have a cross-linking. So um, then we actually have a composite of two polymers to create this the active layer for this the reverse osmosis membrane. Let's take a look at the same image for this um, thin film and composite membrane. So in this case, um, this thin part is the polyamide membrane surface, and this part is the 
um, police function uh, support and this part is simply a fabric backing so we first uh, synthesize the membrane then we attach this membrane to this fabric backing to have enough thickness and enough mechanical structure and by doing that we can easily fabricate membrane modules let's take a look at some characteristics of this uh, foliamide composite auto membranes. So this is uh, the uh, thin film composite membrane. Salt rejection is higher, uh, more than 98% compared with the 95% by this uh, soluble acetate membrane. We can have high rejection and higher silica rejection. And one of the advantage of this membrane is that this can be used uh, at very high pH uh, so it is safe to use this membrane up to pH of 12. Uh, pit pressure we can increase up to 400 uh, psi and the temperature tolerance is higher so it can be used up to uh, 45 Celsius degree and sometimes um, uh, there are some membranes uh, which can be used up to 60 Celsius degree or uh, 80 Celsius degree which are classified as the uh, heat uh, sanitable membranes. And surface charge is um, negative and it has very poor uh, chlorine tolerance so the chlorine tolerance is less than 0.02 milligram per liter compared with the chlorine tolerance of this uh, cellulose acetate membrane, which is 1 milligram per liter. This is uh, very low. So this is clearly a disadvantage. Of this um, uh, polyamide composite membrane. Uh, so once a uh, biofilm formed on the surface of these uh, membranes, it is uh, extremely difficult to control this um, bacteria because we cannot use chlorine to kill this bacteria. Fouling tolerance is fair, um, not excellent because the surface is not fully hydrophilic and uh, it's vulnerable to this biofouling, so we can manage, but it's uh, sometimes very challenging to control membrane fouling. And surface, low uh, surface, uh, surface roughness is rough in this case, so the surface is not uh, perfectly smooth, it's unlike um, cellulose acetate membrane. So if you uh, take a look at this, the, the surface of these membranes by scanning electron microscopy, you can see this kind of these patterns, which means that the surface is very rough. Some membrane manufacturers now offer low fouling membranes. Um, these membranes exist, exhibit better resistance to fouling with suspended solids and this is accomplished, uh, accomplished in several ways. Uh, greater uh, cross-linking of the polymer chain eliminate the uh, hanging function gr uh, groups that can attract foulant. So that's the first strategy. Forced treatment of the membrane polymer in a uh, process uh, sometimes called sizing is also used to minimize fouling of the membrane. Some manufacturers have created membranes with a lower surface charges and a smoother surface, both of which lead to um, minimal organic fouling. So in order to uh, reduce uh, the fouling by particles, we have to control the functional groups and we can also change the surface charge to reduce the uh, organic fouling. So that's about the low fouling membranes. And low pressure membranes have 
also been developed and these membranes offer high flux at low temperature and pressure although uh, some reduction in rejection uh, can occur these low pressure membranes allow for operation at low temperature at low pressure then uh, non non low pressure membranes so in, in this case we have high permeability and low salt rejections so uh, we can apply these membranes uh, for um, in some special applications people also try to use different materials so polyether urethane is another type of thin film membrane these membranes of differs from polyamide uh, membranes in the surface charge and morphology. Polyether retin membranes have a slightly positive charge. Uh, further, the surface of the PEU membrane is smooth, similar to these cellulose acidic membranes, thereby minimizing the potential for fouling. So um, again, this is a special membrane and so and it has two different properties the first one is the surface charge charge positive and second one is surface morphology smooth but again uh, the most widely used uh, auto membranes uh, are made of this uh, fol uh, polyamide. Uh, let's now talk about the membrane modules. In fact, there are four basic types of the auto membrane modules configurations, including the plate and frame, tubular, uh, spiral rounds, and hollow fiber. The packing density is the is the highest for the uh, hollow fiber membranes and the packing density for the uh, spiral round membrane is also uh, relatively high. Uh, on the other hand, uh, plate and frame and tubular membrane modules have very low packing density. Uh, what about the potential for fouling? Uh, the potential for fouling is low for a tubular membrane, moderate for a plate and frame membrane and very high for spiral round membrane module and very high for these uh, hollow fiber membranes and once it is fouled we have to clean the membrane and ease of cleaning can be uh, compared and again tubular membrane is excellent for cleaning and plate and membrane is also easy to be cleaned however the cleaning property uh, is for for both uh, spiral rounds and hollow fiber membrane modules and but um, another um, drawback some drawbacks uh, for the tubula and plate membranes are the is the relative manufacturing cost so they are very expensive, so tubular and plate and uh, play modules are relatively expensive and the manufacturing cost for the spiral round module is moderate and uh, this debt for the hollow fiber membrane is low. So these four uh, module types have uh, pros and cons and especially in case of this reverse osmosis people normally use this spider rounds uh, module type so this is an example of the plate and frame module uh, used in uh, some applications so in this case we just stack the plate uh, plastic sheet uh, membranes um, mounted on a, a plate and we just have some kind of stack structures so that 
we can supply the water from the bottom or from the top and this, and this water can contact with the surface of this uh, plastic membrane and eventually we can get the retentate or and the permeate uh, once we supply the feed water. So that's an um, example of the plate and frame module for reverse osmosis. An example of the tubular module is shown uh, on this slide. And in this case, we have several tubes um, contained in, in, a, uh, in a vessel. And we supply the peat water. And this peat water can pass through these um, membrane tubes. And eventually, we get this concentrate or brine. And since we can collect the permeate on the surface of this membrane tube, and we can um, eventually collect the permeate uh, from the shell side, shell side of this uh, membrane module. Um, this is an example of a spiral round module. And I, I think uh, many students already know what it looks like. So um, if you just look at the appearance, it just looks like a cylinder. But it's more like um, the um, um, we you, you you have to imagine a roll of a paper because um, inside this module there are a lot of uh, the plastic uh, membranes rolled inside uh, this um, this module, and we have certain um, standards for this spot rounds module. So. Um, the length is around one meter, and depending on the application, we may use four inch diameter membrane module or eight inch diameter membrane module. Let's look inside the uh, spiral round membrane module. Uh, as I already explained, uh, inside the module, there are lots of these flash sheet uh, membranes. And we supply this feed water from this side. And between these membranes, we can supply the feed water and we can pressurize to squeeze this water to uh, uh, have the permeate uh, from the other side of this membrane. So the permeate is collected um, through the pipe um, located in the center of this module so the permeate can eventually pass through this tube and the feed water is supplied and eventually the concentrate is collected from the other side of this uh, membrane channel and in this case we uh, have a membrane and to let the uh, feed water pass through uh, we um, insert a feed spacer to have enough um, channel thickness. And to collect the permeate, we also insert the permeate space to collect this, this permeate water. So um, it's more like we have membrane, uh, feed uh, spacer, another membrane, permeate spacer, membrane, feed spacer, something like that. If it is difficult to understand, it is um, better to look at this membrane module uh, from this direction. So again, this is the membrane and this membrane. And this is the permeate spacer. And this is the P the spacer. And we have um, several envelope here and which we call this membrane envelope or um, lip because it looks like a lip so we call it uh, sometimes we call it a lip so there are several uh, lips uh, leaves inside this membrane module and we roll that and we seal these membranes to separate the pit side uh, uh, from the permeate side 
and we pressurize water from the outside of the membrane and inside we can collect the fresh water and eventually we can collect this water uh, uh, through this permeate tube and um, one membrane element uh, in, 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 in the case of spiral rounds is around one meter and it is too short to be used um, directly so we have to connect several membrane elements to formulate a process so uh, between the the element we needed to have a connector and so we use this kind of a connector to separate the permeate from the peat so because the permeate is passing through this line this tube and it is important to uh, prevent this uh, permeate contacting with the peat solution so we need to have this kind of part which is called this interconnector adapter and by putting by inserting this between the the element we can um, pass we can let this uh, permeate pass through this uh, this tube so if you look at this um, the inter uh, connector adapter uh, just look like that so we have the, the o-ring here and this is the tube so the permeate can pass through uh, without contacting the pit solution and sometimes uh, people try to use other types of the connector so interlocking type of this connector is interlocking type of the connector has been also developed and to be used for the reverse osmosis application sometimes uh, leaking is a big issue in reverse osmosis membrane module so in order to prevent such kind of leaking there are several uh, parts used for uh, in this case one of them is the brine seal it is important to separate uh, to uh, prevent the leaking um, through the uh, the outer space of the membrane the element so without this seal the water will not will uh, this, there will be some water by passing this membrane module so we don't want to do that so we put these seals to let this feed water only pass through these feed channels inside this membrane element so this is the brine seal oops brine seal to prevent leaking in actual applications we uh, uh, put several membrane elements in a pipe which is called the vessel and this vessel contains uh, several elements and these elements are connected using some connector adapter or other structures and we also have some seals to prevent the leakage and then we supply the feed water with this the pressurized feed water and we collect this fresh water as well as the brine uh, after passing through this membrane element and membrane vessel so this is uh, how this membrane module look like in fact in this case um, um, we are actually looking at a special auto membrane systems so in this case um, um, we have uh, special uh, membranes used for this application but uh, we'll talk about this later if uh, there's any chance so this is uh, the appearance of the real reverse osmosis membrane element and membrane vessel so this is the element and this is the vessel and this is the connector third pipe or something like that so 
since it is um, um, and this is the sampling port so here we um, we have uh, the o-ring to uh, prevent the leakage as I already explained so the spot around is the most popular module configurations uh, used for reverse osmosis application but in some cases uh, there are uh, some still some places where people use hollow fiber reverse osmosis membrane module so um, this um, slide actually shows uh, such kind of systems so uh, when we use hollow fiber configurations the membrane should be very very tiny and very very thin this so we have to use a very thin fiber which all has the outer diameter of around uh, 85 micrometer and the inner diameter is less than 50 micrometer so this is a very very tiny um, membrane fibers and we connect this uh, we put this um, fibers inside the membrane module so we probably need to have a, a lot of fibers inside this and then we have the people um, have such kind of structures to uh, to make a membrane module so this is one fiber and this is a folding potting and this is the fiber and uh, from the outside of this fiber, the feed water is supplied and it is pressurized, of course. And so the water can pass uh, through the membrane from the outer part to the inner part. So the fresh water can be collected. And so this feed water is supplied and contact with the membrane surface and the part of the water can be uh, collected uh, from the uh, permit outlet and then we can collect this uh, concentrate uh, from the other side of this membrane module so this is the typical configuration of the hollow fiber membrane module for reverse osmosis application so this is a slightly different from the hollow fiber modules used for UF or MF but um, there are several reasons why we need to have this kind of structures and so that's why we need to have a different module structures for reverse osmosis membranes so the main uh, module structures for reverse osmosis membrane are spot rounds and hollow fiber uh, but let's also consider other module configurations. Uh, one of the, one of the such uh, cases is the raw cam. Uh, this membrane has developed um, three module configurations, which offer reduced rate of membrane fouling. So the for first of this uh, raw cam membrane the module is to minimize membrane fouling because spider rounds hollow fiber they are uh, vulnerable to membrane fouling and if you wanted to treat the wastewater such uh, configurations may not be suitable for uh, because uh, because of that um, people try to modify the module configurations and rock cam is one of such examples this is achieved using often feed flow channels and short feed flow water pass followed by a 180 degree flow reversal that introduced tubulus. So the secret of the Rokem membrane module is the creation of the tubulus that can wash out the fallant Accumul accumulating on the membrane surface so um, many variety of spiral rounds polyamide composite membranes 
are available to suit different feed conditions. So when we talk about reverse osmosis membranes, in fact, um, these are just not just the one membranes. In fact, there are different types of the reverse osmosis membranes with different water permeability and different salt permeabilities. So, um, depending on the feed, con con uh, feed properties and the applications, we need to have the different reverse osmosis membranes with different properties. And we can have this kind of classifications, including the seawater membranes, brackish water membranes, brackish low energy membranes, brackish low differential pressure membranes, and brackish low fouling membranes. So let's take a look at them very briefly. So let's talk about the seawater membrane. As you can imagine from this name, these membranes are used to have carry out seawater desalination. So the peat water concentration is generally um, like this. So um, for example, uh, 32,000 milligrams per liter of sodium chloride um, may be contained in the seawater and so the membrane should treat such kind of heat solution. So um, this water has very high osmotic pressure. Sure, higher 20 bar. And if you have recovery up to 50%, the osmotic pressure of the brine is brine will be 40 bar. So in order to make this reverse osmosis work, we needed to have the applied pressure at least higher than the osmotic pressure of the brine. So the applied pressure should be at least higher than uh, 40 bar. And in order to have enough driving force, the driving force is delta P minus delta phi as you as we studied from the equation of this solution diffusion model. So that should be at least 10 bar. So the minimum pressure in this case is uh, 50 bar. And later we'll talk about this issue in detail. But if there's a fouling, we needed to have this driving force more than 10 bar, so sometimes we need to have these 15 bar, 20 bars. So um, in such cases, uh, the pressure will increase. So the operating pressure um, may be determined by this kind of consideration. Water temperature, um, it ranges from 10 Celsius degree to 40 Celsius degree, uh, depending on the location. And the feed water uh, pH ranges from 6.5 to 8. And the re recovery per module ranges from 8 to 10 um, percent. So if you use uh, several of um, these modules in series, we can achieve um, recovery that is for the whole process. So, for example, if you use um, several uh, membrane elements in a best cell, the recovery for the best cell is actually the sum of the recovery uh, of the all elements inside this best cell. So there are several types of this, uh, the seawater membranes from different manufacturers. So if you are interested, you can take a look at them. And here we just have this um, examples. So the permeate uh, flow at a standard condition is um, um, ranges from 7,000 to 10,000 GVD gallon per day. And the rejection should range uh, over 99.7%. The second type is the brackish water membrane. 
um, that is, uh, they are designed to deal with the peat um, water with the concentration of the uh, 1,500 to 2,000 milligram per liter um, sodium chloride or TDS. And sometimes for low energy membranes are tested at 500 to 2,000 milligram per liter sodium chloride. The operating pressure is lower than this, the uh, seawater membranes. Um, so it ranges from 100 psi to 225 psi, and it is designed to work at room temperatures, but it can be used for um, lower temperatures or uh, higher temperatures. And the recovery for module is higher because it, this membrane has a higher uh, permeability um, than this uh, reverse, uh, seawater reverse osmosis membranes. So the recovery for module is 15%. And in, in, in most cases, the recovery of the system, of the process, not the module, um, it ranges um, from 60 to 90s. Another interesting type of the membranes is the low energy membranes. Low energy membranes are designed to reduce the energy required energy, the energy required to generate permeate. In most cases, these membranes exhibit similar productivity, but it works at a lower operating pressure. So even if we use low energy membranes, it does not necessarily mean that this is a high flux membrane because we use similar flux conditions uh, because the, the design flux is controlled by the uh, degree of pretreatment of the peat solution. So if the, for example, if the peat water is um, groundwater or surface water, um, they should have different design flocks. So um, although the membrane has higher um, permeability, we need to keep the design flux guidelines so that we maintain similar flux but lower the operating pressure in case of the low pressure, low energy membranes. So low pressure means low energy so that this membrane can use uh, lower energy. So lower operating pressure is an advantage when energy costs are high or when the peat water temperature is low. But there is a limitation, including the re low rejection. Uh, the rejection is normally uh, lower than the standard brackish water membranes because there is a trade-off relationship because uh, between um, rejection and permeability, water permeability. So if you wanted to increase the rejection, you needed to sacrifice the water permeability. And in this case, if you wanted to increase the water permeability, you have to sacrifice the rejection. So in general, low energy membranes uh, exhibit a lower rejection. On the opposite of the uh, low energy membrane is the high rejection membranes. The high rejection brackish water membranes offer several tenths of a percent higher rejection than standard uh, brackish water membranes. So um, while the standard rejection uh, ranges from 99 to 99.5, the higher rejection membranes can result in 
um, the uh, rejection uh, over 99.7 percent, which is very high. Um, again, um, this membrane is very important in producing high purity water uh, required by semiconductor required in semiconductor industry or other fine chemical industries. And again, in this case, the water permeability may be lower than the standard brackish water membrane, but we can um, utilize the advantage of high rejection um, when this application requires, uh, requires such membranes. We already uh, discussed the uh, low fouling membranes um, earlier in this chapter. Low fouling membranes are available from some manufacturers. These membranes can be modified by several ways to reduce the potential for fouling. Uh, so uh, maybe later we'll uh, we already discussed this uh, the modification techniques and. Um, these membranes are very useful for applications that may um, uh, have high fouling potential by the peat water. There are several different types of the membrane fouling and one of the reasons for fouling is the blockage of the uh, membrane channel by the suspended solid and if this is the problem, we may reduce this fouling potential by using different feed spacers. So in this case, uh, we are comparing the membranes uh, with different um, uh, feed spacers. So um, there are three feed spacers used in this example, 28 mils, 31 mils, and 34 mils. And this, these 34 mils uh, result in a uh, thicker um, bead channel, uh, which is which provides the benefit of reducing uh, channel blockage by suspended particles. Thicker feed spacers are more forgiving to fouling with suspended solid than thinner spacers. So, changing a spacer is one way that we can consider to reduce membrane fouling. Low differential pressure membrane modules can be considered a subset of low fouling membranes. So as I already explained by the previous slide, by changing the spacers or by using a thick spacers, we can reduce the channel blockage and we can reduce the the increase in the differential pressure by the uh, uh, particles. So example of low differential pressure membrane modules are Tulum Tech um, BW3400 uh, 34i. 34i means that this module uses a 35 mil feed spacer, which is the uh, which is a very thick spacer compared with the standard piece spacer, which is a 28 mil. Another type that we have to look at is the high productivity membrane modules, which contains more membrane area than standard brackish water membranes despite fitting into the same size membrane modules. So this is like this, the, the opposite case of the um, low differential uh, pressure membranes because if you wanted to have more membranes in the in a same size element, we needed to reduce the feed of channel thickness uh, and we need to use uh, thin uh, spacers and we also need to increase the packing density and that will um, actually provide the higher risk for the differential pressure increase. So uh, this is actually required 
for in the case that there is a low uh, possibility of having a very high um, differential pressure differential pressure increase but anyway um, higher membrane area is achieved using more sophisticated module assembly techniques and in addition to the use of thin spacers we can have different type of the modifications like um, we can um, carefully position the glue lines so that we can maximize the membrane effective membrane areas while a uh, standard brackish membrane type typically has around 365 square feet of the membrane area per an element high productivity membrane modules may have um 400 uh, square feet or up to 450 square feet of the membrane area so um, that clearly has a benefit because more membrane area means we can reduce the flux and we can reduce the the applied pressure so we can um, actually reduce the energy consumption and in addition there are a lot of advantages that we can have more membrane areas per an element so uh, in general a uh, 400 square feet membrane module produce around about 10 percent more permeate than uh, 365 square feet per membrane modules under similar operating conditions so one element can produce more than 10 percent of the uh, more permeate which is uh, which we can save the number of membrane elements in for a specific application so we can reduce the capital cost by using these high productivity uh, membrane modules uh, we also have other membrane module types and it's in, in case of the seawater desalination, boron rejection is problematic and in such cases we may need to have a special membrane that has very high boron rejection. So high boron rejection membrane have been developed by several manufacturers of the reverse osmosis membrane and Another type is the sanitary membrane module, um, which have a net outer wrap um, rather than this standard fiberglass wrap and sometimes referred as a full fit modules. So it is fully sealed so that we can guarantee a sanitary condition. The next thing that we are going to study is flow patterns in reverse osmosis process. We studied that the, the RO element is the smallest unit that consists the whole RO system and pressure vessel contains several RO elements. So um, we studied the pressure the elements and and array uh, vessel pressure vessel and if we have a number of pressure vessels in this case we can say that as skid or train or array
Uh, this figure shows an example for uh, an array. And in this case, uh, we say that this is a two by one configuration with two stages. And in this case, uh, stage means uh, that if the brine from the first system is connected uh, to the second system as the feed, this is brine, this is feed. So in this case, uh, the feed solution is uh, con further concentrated by the second system. So in this case, we can we say that the first system is called uh, stage one, uh, first stage, and the second sta system is called the second stage. And since we have two vessels here, so that uh, we say this is the two by one the uh, the system two by one array with two stage with two pressure vessels. Uh, from the previous slide, if we assign the flow rate, approximate flow rate, we can, uh, we can draw uh, like this figure. So if we supply 100 gallon per minute of the peace solution, and if the recovery is uh, 50%, we'll have 50 of the uh, 50 gallon per day, a gallon, gallon per minute of the permeate uh, from the first stage, then we'll have, the, that's the permeate, and we'll have uh, 50 gallon per minute of the brine from the first stage, or stage one, and then this brine will be further concentrated to extract um, 25 uh, gallon per minute of the permeate here. So that's new permeate. And then we will eventually have this brine of 25 gallon per minute at the end of this system. So in summary, we'll have 25 gallon per minute of the brine. And then we'll have 75 gallon per minute of the permeate or product. So the whole, the, the overall recovery of this system will be 75%. So each stage has 50% of the recovery and the overall and the overall recovery becomes 25 percent let's think about the concentration let's assume that this membrane has the uh, uh, rejection of 98 percent which means if we treat the PD solution with the uh, TDS of 100 milligram per liter will have the product permeate of 2 milligram per liter um, in this case. And the concentrate will have approximately 200 milligram per liter of the concentration. Then it will be treated uh, by the second stage. And then this uh, permeate concentration from the second stage will be doubled uh, because the peat concentration is doubled uh, in this case. So um, if you consider the, f the flow ratios, uh, because here we have 2 milligram per liter multiplied by 50 gallon per minute. And here we have 4 milligram per liter multiply by 25 gallon per minute and in order to get the final concentration we have to divide it we have to divide it with the 75 gallon per 
minutes and that will be the average concentration of the permeate which will be 2.67 in this case of course the final concentration will be 400 approximately 400 milligram per liter because it is further uh, concentrated in the second stage let's look inside the best cell in the best cell we have several elements uh, the serial uh, connected in series and assuming that we have six elements in a vessel and if we supply the PID solution with a flow rate of 100 gallon per minute with a concentration of 100 milligram per liter and we'll see what's going on inside this vessel if we use six element in this case let's assume that this the recovery per element is 11 percent and the uh, uh, solute rejection by this membrane is 98 percent so uh, first um, in the beginning we will have 100 gallon per minute and 100 milligram per liter and after passing through the first element the um, brine concentration will be will become 112 milligram per liter while the brine flow rate will be 89 gallon per minute and the permit concentration will be 2 milligram per liter and permit flow rate will be 11 gallon per minute which is 11 percent of the peat flow rate so the way that we can calculate the concentration and flow rate of the brine is in fact feed flow rate feed concentration uh, multiplied by feed concentration equals um, brine concentration or retentate flow rate and retentate concentration plus permeate flow rate and permeate concentration and the ratio of the the relationship between the uh, permeate flow rate and permeate uh, uh, feed flow rate is this one so the if the REC is the recovery uh, the if you multiply the flow rate with the recovery we'll have the permeate flow rate so by solving these two equations at the same time you will get these concentrations so let's repeat this one by one so after passing the second element will have a higher concentration of 127 milligram per liter while you have a reduced flow rate of 778.3 so it will uh, further uh, it will be further reduced to 69 62 55 and eventually you'll have 49.9 or approximately 50 so the uh, recovery um, by this best cell is 50 percent so eventually you will have 50 gallon per minute of the retentate and 50 gallon per minute of the permeate from this system and the final um, the concentration uh, will be 200 sorry that's mistype 200 um, um, milligram per liter and you have the concentration of 2.61 uh, milligram per liter approximately I guess so uh, that's what's going on inside this uh, the auto vessel uh, this kind of flow pattern is important because 
uh, it is related to the scale formation and fouling as well as the permit quality and overall performance. So for example, if you have the feed solution that has a certain scaling potential, if the feed solution is concentrated inside the, the, the best cells, uh, in, in such cases, um, at some point, uh, in a certain element will ha have the condition that this scale formation start to occur even though in, in the feed solutions uh, the f uh, scaling uh, the, the potential is low. So here in this example we are monitoring this uh, the NSI of the feed solution and the retentate and the, in the solution inside the membrane best cell and initially the LSI is zero so it means that it's safe to be used however if you treat this PD solution with uh, two stage of uh, the outer membrane systems since the concentration increases the LSI increases so the uh, risk of the scaling scale formation uh, becomes higher as we follow this uh, the uh, flow lines flow directions so in the previous case we just consider a typical configuration that there is no recycle of the concentrate or retentate however in some cases we need to recycle the reject or brine to adjust the recovery or adjust the, uh, the water balance. So let's just consider this kind of system. In this case, we have a Q by one array with a concentrate recycle, which means we supply the feed solution and the feed solution is concentrated uh, in, a, in, uh, in the stage one and it is further concentrated in the st stage two and we now have a retentate um, from this uh, uh, stage two and part of the retentate is recycled back to the uh, PID solution so the, in fact, the feed solution is the mixture of the fresh feed solution and the reject from the second stage. Uh, so, um, uh, so we have certain flow rate uh, that is what the rejected water and the recycled uh, concentrate. So, um, so that um, uh, because of this line it's different from the previous example. By the way, a concentrate recycle is generally used in a smaller RO system where the cross flow velocity is not high enough to maintain good scoring of the membrane surface. So if you uh, deal with uh, small uh, the flow rate uh, of the field solution, we may not be able to increase the uh, flow rate to satisfy the desire, desired conditions for the, the auto operation. So in order to maintain the, uh, the flow rate, we may need to recycle the, the uh, uh, concentrate uh, from the uh, stage one or stage two. But in this case, recycle has some disadvantages as well. Uh, for example, it actually reduces overall uh, product quality because the peat water is mixed with the highly concentrated brine. So it actually affects the uh, product water quality. And of course, it requires a uh, larger feed pump because we need to uh, depressurize a uh, higher volume of the solution and 
Of course, we also need to have uh, spend more ener energy uh, because of the reject and influent streams coming together and must be repressurized. This results in higher operating cost for the system. So this is uh, one of the reasons why this small scale auto system is generally very expensive. Let's consider on another um, uh, configurations, uh, so-called the double pass system. So in this case, uh, instead of having uh, many stages, we are introducing a concept of pass. So pass means the product water from the previous system is supplied to the next system, next other system as the feed solution. In the previous case, uh, when we talk about the uh, stage, the brine is used as the feed solution to another other system, but in this case, we use the product as the feed solution to, the, to another the other system. The reason is, the quality of the water from the uh, first pass is not sufficient. So we needed to remove more ions and more salt. So we needed to pass this water again to polish the solution. So the second pass auto uh, is needed to polish it, to polish it the first pass auto product to yield higher quality water. So this kind of system is used to produce high quality water such as ultra pure water but sometimes we also needed to apply this for seawater desalination because the first pass auto system may not be able to produce the sufficiently high quality product water. The recovery of the second pass can be as high as 90%. So in this case, in the second pass auto system, uh, we are treating very high quality water. So we can increase the recovery up to 90% very easily. But it, it can be done by using more than two stages because the single stage or single pass cannot, um, uh, the, the single stage cannot uh, allow such high rejection, uh, recovery. This high recovery can be achieved because of the relatively low concentration of dissolved solid in the influent to the second pass. The overall system recovery will be 70, um, um, 3 percent with 75 percent first pass and 90 percent uh, second pass recoveries. Let's talk about multiple trains or skids um, placed in parallel, which are used when a, a larger flow rate needed, needed to be treated. So in a large scale system, we needed to have more than 10 or 12 the pressure vessels. In such cases, we needed to have um, many pressure vessels uh, fairly connected to treat the water at the same time. And so um, and you can imagine a very large scale system in these cases. There is an advantage to using uh, multiple skis in that multiple skids provide redundancy for the system. So uh, if you have many skids, in, in this case, one, if one skid is down, you can use other stage, uh, and you can also have a stage which is not running and, uh, in normal conditions, but you can use this in emergency situations. So that's the concept of the redundancy. The drawback of multiple skids is in capital and operating cost. The greater the number of skids, the greater the capital and operating or 
maintenance costs. This cost must be weighted, weighed again against the ability to still provide water during shutdown of any one skid for cleaning or maintenance. In some cases, multiple stage will make economic sense and in others bringing in temporary equipment uh, during shutdown will make economic sense. Uh, in this section, we are going to study the, the auto skit. So this is um, uh, a typical appearance of a uh, auto skit uh, used in a small scale system. And if you closely look at this picture, you can find uh, several components uh, in this system. So this is the cartridge filter used to protect the auto membrane as well as the high pressure pump. And this is the, the auto feed pump or high pressure pump. And this is the pressure vessels, as you know, the, 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 these white cylinders. And of course, in order to operate this system, we needed to have the instrumentation controls, and we can also the obtain data from this system. And the whole structure, the, met the metal frame, is the uh, the uh, the arrow skid frame. And in addition, there are some other parts which is uh, required for the operation of the system, which, is, which can be classified as the auxiliary equipment. So in this uh, flow diagram, um, we can see the, the main component used for you know, our system. So um, let's assume that the water is already pre-treated, and after that, this water should pass through several components, including this the isolation valve, which is used to uh, install or remove or shut down the systems. And uh, there are some instrumentations like uh, and sensors like ORP temperature, pressure, conductivity, which I'll explain uh, later a little bit more and another isolation valve, which is just uh, for um, each maintenance of, or installation of the system. And then uh, one of the main component, one of the most important component here is the high pressure pump because we needed to have very high pressure for running the outer system. And Another main component here is the cartridge filter to protect this auto membrane. And of course, this auto membrane um, in here, we uh, this includes the elements and vessels. Uh, that's the part for water production and uh, salt rejection. And uh, from this will have two flow lines. Uh, the first flow line is the product and the second flow line is the reset, the reset or brine. And in each case, we need the instrumentations like here and some valves for controlling the water flows. Um, so um, although this example shows typical uh, components, but in real systems, you may need more instrumentations and more components or uh, you can uh, just the omit several the, the components if it is necessary to do that so so there may be some variations but uh, this actually shows the uh, the very typical cases that you have to have for uh, the configuring this auto system. Cartridge filters 
are usually used to directly pre-treat inflamed water just prior to the auto membranes. Um, catheter filters are designed to designed to prevent resin and media that um, that may have carried over from the upstream softeners and filters. So uh, we have the pretreatment system, and from these systems, there may be some impurities and particles and debris that may affect the integrity of the auto membrane so we need to cut out such kind of these the things so we install this catheter filter to protect the auto membrane and sometimes we install this catheter filter prior to this the auto feed pump so to um uh, to protect this the auto feed pump or high uh, high pressure pump and uh, protect the impellers as well as the auto membrane modules and so the catalytic filters are designed to remove uh, macro particles that could physically evade or penetrate the thin film membrane layers catalytic filters are not intended for bulk removal of suspended solid turbidity or sdi so um, oh, you may think that this cartridge filter can be used as the uh, pre-treatment method, but it is not they are not intended to do that because cartridge filters are disposable and if you start to use uh, for the feed water pre-treatment, you have to frequently replace the cartridge filters, which will be really annoying. So you should not do that uh, so uh, the catalytic filter should stick to their own function to which is the protection of the feed uh, pump the auto pump and membranes catalytic filters with a rating of one two three microns the absolute are sometimes used when colloidal silica or metal silica, uh, silicates are present but um, usually uh, the cartridge filters with a rating of five, 5 microns are used uh, if you, you use the fine cartridge filters this will increase the operating cost for the system. Uh, these foldable catheter filters are recommended over back washable filter. Back washable filters suffer from several limitations, such as the risk of a breakthrough if the back washing mechanism fails, and lower efficiency than the disposable filters and higher bio fouling risk so um bag washable um, seems to be uh, very good for reducing the cost but um, you have to remember that these the catalytic filters are designed and used for the protection of pumps and membranes so there shouldn't be any uh, break the uh, any problems of the uh, such as breakthrough and the biofouling biofilm formations uh, so um, it's still recommended to use the disposable filters uh, this slide shows several uh, different types of these catalytic filters used in the field so we have the double often end uh, filters or single often end filters and depending on the uh, situations you may choose different types of the catalytic filters in most cases um, a centric figure type of the pump is used as the auto feed pump but some uh, in but um, some old units still use positive displacement pump 
centrifugal pump are well suited to breakwater auto applications because these pumps operate uh, favorably at medium flow at relatively low pressures. On the other hand, positive displacement pumps have higher hydraulic efficiencies but are plagued with the high, higher maintenance requirement uh, relative to the centrifugal pumps. So the, the use of positive displacement pump is limited to the uh, small scale systems and in uh, large scale systems uh, people prefer to using centrifugal pumps. Uh, if you wanted to select a pump for your auto system, you have to know how to read the pump curve provided by these uh, pump manufacturers. So this is an example of the uh, pump curve and that shows the, um, the information such as power, uh, MPSH, and efficiency, and head. For example, a 200 uh, uh, gallon per minute influent flow uh, to an auto system um, that requires 250 uh, psi operating pressure would need a four stage pump with a 6, 6, uh, 6.69 in impeller diameter and a, um, a 60 horsepower motor. So this kind of the information can be obtained from the pump curve and um, by the pump manufacturers. So without that, you cannot determine the, uh, the proper power and proper motors and proper impellers for your application. The curve also indicates the net pressure suction head required to prevent cavitation of the pump. So the NPSH all means the pressure uh, for the required for the uh, for the supply of the solution the water to the pump. So um, if you have too low pressure, you will uh, suffer from the cavitation of the pump, which is critical. So you ha also have to consider this value. So the efficiency is also very important and the efficiency uh, can be estimated uh, by using this pump curve. The pump efficiency ranges from um, 60% to 90% uh, depending on the type of the pump, size of the pump, and the uh, characteristics of the pump. Uh, on the other hand, the motor efficiencies run at about 90%. Each pump and motor combination has its own specific pump curve. Uh, when you use pump, sometimes it is difficult to change the flow rate as well as the pressure required for the operation of the auto system. So in such cases, we need to add a special device called the VFD, which is Variable Frequency Drivers. So they are sometimes used to adjust the operation of the, uh, the uh, operation of the motor. The functionality of a VFD is to convert frequency uh, um, to um, motor speed. So um, by adjusting the frequency, uh, it can control the uh, speed of the motor and then we can actually control the function of the pump. So uh, for example, if the membrane fouls or uh, scale, uh, scale formation occurs, 
The VFD will automatically adjust the speed of the motor to generate higher pressure to compensate for the fouling and scaling, which lowers flow through the membranes. So um, in this case, we the VFD can adjust the speed of the motor to increase the pressure, uh, but uh, since the pump has its own um, uh, performance curve, so the uh, flow rate may be changed in this case. Uh, an inverter duty motor is required for a, a VFD, so uh, not all motors can be used with the VFD. So this picture shows an example of the VFD uh, control cabinet. And inside this cabinet, you can see several of uh, the electrical uh, devices. Uh, for a large scale uh, RO system, which requires a large pump, in this case, we needed to have a VFD, uh, a large VFD, which is very expensive. So sometimes use the uh, use of a VFD will increase the capital cost significantly. But even with that, um, the with the increased expense, we still needed to use VFD in uh, many cases because. Using VFD, we can significantly reduce the operating cost. Uh, let's talk about the pump again. The discharge uh, for centrifugal, centrifugal pump is typically adjusted using a proportional pressure control valve to achieve the required operating pressure unless a uh, VFD is installed, in which case the pump speed is adjusted to achieve the required uh, discharge uh, uh, pressure. So in this case, without the use of, uh, without VFD, the way, the method to control the pressure uh, uh, for the pit solution uh, pressure of the pit solution is to use this pressure control valve. So this pump will uh, um, will create the constant pressure. But if you need the lower pressure, in this case, you have to um, use this valve to reduce the pressure, so that we can adjust the pit pressure by controlling this valve. So as you can see, this is a method uh, uh, that wastes some the hydraulic energy as well as the electricity. So uh, in in this case, um, um, this is uh, the operating cost uh, will be very expensive compared with the case that we used VFD because VFD is directly connected to the the, the centrifugal pump to control the motor speed, so there will be um, a minimum uh, reduction, uh, min uh, the, the, well, the, the waste of the hydraulic pressure will be minimized by using VFD. As membranes age, uh, the performance changes negatively um, due to the effect of fouling and scaling or degradation. Uh, these changes require adjustment in the uh, control valve settings. For example, assuming the membrane flux de declines about 15% uh, over 3 years, the control valve will be needed to be throttled to increase the discharge uh, pressure to compensate for the uh, loss in the flux. The auto feed pumps should be selected based on a 10% pressure premium over 3 year um, membrane life pressure requirements. 
as projected by the ARO design program. The, later, we'll uh, discuss about the, the ARO design programs. Uh, um, probably, it will appear in the um, in uh, later chapters. Uh, but the thing that you have to know is the membrane for first uh, the membrane performance will be uh, degraded uh, with the time and when you first select the pump you have to consider the degradation of the membrane performance over the period that you are going to use this membrane so if you wanted to use this membrane for three years you have to consider the performance of the membrane uh, after three years. So the pump will have enough power to produce water even after three years in this example. This ensures that enough pressure has been built in to the pump and motor to overcome any irreversible fouling then may occur over the life of the membranes. Pumps uh, should be uh, started slowly to prevent water hammer. If you suddenly turn on the pump, you will experience the water hammer, which will create a very loud sound with the high uh, pressure pulse, which will damage the whole system. So um, water pump hammer can cause cracks in the outer shell of the membrane modules as well as the compaction of the membrane itself. So uh, it actually results in a uh, sharp increase in the water pressure. So it, uh, is, um, it is really bad. Uh, furthermore, water hammer causes the membrane modules to move the bacille which can cause wear to the o-rings used in the uh, standard interconnectors and eventually you will see some leaks of the peat water into the permeate so again the permeate quality will be degraded and there will be a lot of uh, problems uh, together with this water ham hammer an increase in pressure of no more than 10 psi per second is recommended. Some motors uh, may be equipped with a soft start that regulates the speed with which they start up. So um, there are certain um, statements that you have to remember. The first one is use centrifugal pump. Um, if positive displacement pumps must be used, these pumps may be fitted with approval pulsation uh, damping equipment because the, uh, the positive uh, displacement pumps create the pulsations of the flow and pressures. So it is not good. So you need to have some devices to compensate this pulsation. So surge tank may be used and uh, particularly for uh, a very short and very long pipe runs. Air should be vented from the system because the having air inside the pump system always cause problems. So uh, you needed to have a flushing uh, cycle or mechanical bands at the utmost section of the pipe work in question. And you need to be careful with the valve operation. Flow valve should be open when the pump are activated. Uh, during valve change over, the closed valve should complete its opening cycle before the, the open valve closes. Flow valves uh, should of fail often and valves should have adequate the, ac the actuation time. A uh, solenoid valve closing in 40 millisecond in a stream pressurized to 50 psi 
will generate a total pressure spike of about 490 psi, which is um, um, uh, uh, which is a significant number. Low pressure and volume to the suction side of the pump. So suction side means the water um, will be pressurized to the auto membrane, and this is pump, and this is the suction side. So um, the low pressure uh, in on the suction side uh, may cause uh, these kind of problems. Uh, excessive um, pressure drop through the pretreatment system uh, will cause the problem uh, in the on the suction side, and deficient pretreatment design is uh, another reason that we have uh, low pressure in the uh, in the suction side. And the final one is the forced insulation modifications. So initially uh, the design was good, but if you add several things that will affect the pressure of the suction side and they may cause problems. As we already studied, a pressure vessel is the pressure housing for membrane modules and contains the pressurized uh, uh, feed water. Uh, various pressure ratings are available depending on the application. So we have different types of the pressure vessel depending on the applications. Pressure vessels are made to specially, uh, uh, specifically to accommodate whatever diameter of the membrane module uh, being used. The length of the pressure vessel can be as short as uh, one uh, membrane module in length up to seven uh, uh, the membrane module in series. So typically one element can hold up to seven or eight elements. It means the length will be as long as the maximum length may be up to eight meter. But we can imagine a very short uh, pressure vessel that only can hold one element. So in this case, the length of the pressure vessel may be just around one or one meter. We already studied the pressure vessel. As you know that this pressure vessel have several membrane modules or membrane elements. Pressure vessels are usually constructed of fiberglass or stainless steel. And fiberglass is uh, typically used for industrial non-sanitary uh, applications. And stainless steel vessels, stainless steel vessels are preferred for sanitary application. Um, the reason why people prefer the fiberglass vessel is because it's uh, definitely cheaper, and it is be uh, this is actually better for the application of treating high salinity water. So uh, this, these pictures shows how we can uh, disassemble a pressure vessel and pour out this the, the membrane module and push back this membrane module. So as you can imagine, uh, it requires uh, some um, efforts to install or uh, remove this the uh, modules uh, uh, from this membrane vessel. Um, this is an example of this end cap um, that actually um, they, uh, they are used to seal the pressure vessel. So normally in a pressure vessel we'll have that's the pressure vessel and we'll need to have two end caps. So these are the end caps that you can, which is shown 
on this slide and if you uh, look at this end cap you see that this is uh, very um, this is um, directly connected to this membrane module and we also use a snap link to hold the pressure vessel and the cap in place so we install this snap link to um, on the uh, the uh, fix this the end cap uh, to the pressure vessel um, there is another part which is called shim and shim a shim is used to prevent modules from moving back and force during pressurization you see that um, when you operate the auto system there will be a sharp there will be a sharp increase in pressure or sharp decrease in pressure um, then may change the location of the membrane module and this is not good so in order to prevent such kind of things we have to use uh, a special device which is called a shim some movement could uh, since such movement could uh, wear on the internal o-ring seals so that we need to use shims uh, which uh, are plastic spacer rings similar to the washers and they are typically um, 0.2 inches thick and can be um, used to uh, for this purpose and it is made of some PVC or, or um, uh, uh, it is made of uh, uh, some uh, plastics Uh, I guess uh, uh, this is the end of today's lecture and in the next lecture we are going to continue the uh, to look at other parts in the 